sings, our choir is going to sing a song called The Blessing. And Brother Carter and Landon and I are starting to read through a little book. And as I was reading through this chapter of this book, one little section caught me this morning. And it's that interaction that Jesus had with Peter after the denial, after Jesus had risen from the dead and as they were sitting, they just had a meal together and he asked Peter, Peter, do you love me? Peter said, Lord, do you know I love you? He said, then feed my sheep. And that happens not two times, but three times. And what I picked up on that <clears throat> is that we have a Lord that no matter what we do, if we're his children, if we confess our sins to him, it says he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But that fellowship, a lot of times, is broken because of us, not him. You understand what I'm trying to say? There's going to be a line in this song that we sing at least 16 times that says this, he is for you. He is for you. Don't forget that, that the Lord of the universe who created it all loved you enough to send Jesus because he's for you. It says that the Father's will is that none should perish. So understand that today. You may have come in here in a, with a sense of failure, something that happened in your life, maybe just yesterday, maybe this morning. You have a Lord that's for you. You may have come in here not knowing the Lord is your Savior at all. He's for you because He sent Jesus to die for you. Don't miss that today. Open your heart. Open your heart to what the Lord can do as we sing the blessing.
beautiful words, sung beautifully, played beautifully. Uh, uh, I don't know about you, I'm captivated by beauty right now uh, from the Lord. And uh, so what an incredible posture of worship uh, to, to be able to come before the Lord with those uh, truths. Um, I, I hope that's comforting to you today. I, I so appreciate uh, those lines uh, of scripture sung very well, uh, but, but even if they were sung poorly, the truth of them would still be very real. And uh, that is that the Lord is for us. I think that's sometimes hard for us to, to grasp, hard for us to think about that Wow, if God really knew who I was, he wouldn't be for me. Uh, If he really knew who we all were sitting in here right now, he wouldn't really be for us. Well, guess what? He does, and he's still for us. Uh, Not because we deserve that, but because he has given us Christ's righteousness and has elevated us well beyond what we deserve. And uh, so that's an incredible thing to come before the Lord and and say thank you for. So let's, um, let's do that now. Father... I am humbled beyond words to have the honor of being your son. And I think I speak for everyone in here that would say the same, be they a son or a daughter of the Most High God, that the God of the universe, of every atom of existence, uh, knows us by name and has called us his. So this morning, uh, I pray that our spirits rejoice in that reality. And, And that drives us to such a posture of thanksgiving to the Lord, to Jesus for his shed blood, which has secured us. And that elevates us to a place of confidence, not in ourselves, but in God. And we know we don't deserve that. And so it keeps us humble as well. And this gospel has united us. And and so I pray right now for every person in here, whatever need was brought into this room, that it would be met in the finished work of Christ Jesus on the cross and the indwelling spirit that is among us right now. And so I pray whatever needs are out there are met today, not in just going through motions, uh, but instead through the means of grace, so thank you, God, for that. I pray right now as the summer is coming to a close and school begins this week uh, and, and ramps up in the weeks to come, I pray for, for all those involved, be they homeschooling, private schooling, public schooling, whatever it may be, God, uh, I pray you'd give all teachers, all administrators, everyone the, the strength, the patience, the courage, the, the truth. Uh, not just to convey information, but to to be a conduit of grace in everyday life. I pray for our students who will report soon, and I pray that you would help them to see that school is not just mindless activity, but is instead a, a place to learn, to grow, to make connections, form relationships, to be missionaries in a very fertile and lost place in our community. I pray that as parents are probably soon to send their their students, their college students off back to where they are uh, gonna learn, I pray you give them comfort as well. Help those with, uh, who can't be physically near their kids always to give them the comfort to know that God is. I pray for a new life. I pray for a new birth. I thank you for this church, for their love, for future generations. And I thank you that our family is secure, not just our biological family, but through the ages, we stand shoulder to shoulder with hundreds of thousands, if not millions, billions of people who have called Christ the Lord. And God, you have preserved your people every generation through your spirit, and we continue that work today. We know that you do that, and so we glorify your great name for it. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Let's all stand together as we continue singing praise to the Lord. The book of Habakkuk, this is Richard's translation. It says something along these lines. Go home and read it. It says, if there are no cattle in the stalls, there's no fruit on the vine, 
yet I will praise the Lord. This song kind of goes along that deal, um, along that progression of having great things. And then when we're right at the end of our days, I will still bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Amen. so many things about your amazing grace today and Lord how you're for us and how we know you're good Lord let us never forget that that you were so good that you sent Jesus because we were all hopeless and doomed 
before he stepped out of heaven and came to this earth. And Lord, I pray for someone in here that may not know you today as Lord and Savior. Lord, that you, through the power of your Holy Spirit, would draw that person from death into life. Let them know that there's no way they can live this life on their own. Lord, maybe for the believer who's been a believer for a very long time, but they're, they've fallen under the weight of sin, Lord, there's release from that too. Lord, maybe for families that are in disarray, they're trying to do things their own way, and Lord, as we'll learn in just a minute, unless you build the house, everything we're doing is in vain. Father, it's really so simple. We just need to trust you in everything we do. We love you, Lord. We pray that your Holy Spirit would open our ears so we can hear the truths that are about to be brought through Brother Carter. Lord, speak through him, we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Be seated, please. We have been reading the Psalms of Ascent, uh, so marching on this journey. The Psalms of Ascent are 15 psalms. And uh, they are an invitation, a journey, a road to walk. Uh, And it mirrors the Christian life. It mirrors uh, maturity. And so as you are kind of going through your Christian life, uh, you're going to encounter basically the theme of every one of these songs at some point or another. The Israelites would sing these on their way to Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is at a higher elevation than most every other place in Israel. And so as they are physically rising in elevation, they sing these songs, they spiritually rise as well uh, to be in a place of worship for the Lord. Um, And so what a joy to read these together, uh, to be on this journey. We've covered seven already, and so today we come to number eight, and this song is that of work. Now, work is a good and natural part of our lives. I have a uh, vague recollection, uh, or not a vague, or rather a, a vibrant recollection of uh, football camp uh, way back when I played. We had some guys uh, survive this week, uh, high school football camp two a days. Uh, and I remember our coach woke us up one morning and we were stretching in the pre dawn darkness and uh, everybody's complaining. And, and I remember uh, Coach, he, he yelled out, and I was a little bit worried. I thought we might get some extra work in there because of our complaining. But I'll never forget, he just said, boys, all this is is work. Don't be scared of it. It's no different than everything you're going to do for the rest of your life. It's just work. Just do it. And I've taken that lesson. I've used that a hundred times in my life. I've heard that in my head. Uh, and I think that there's a truth to that, that work is so much more than our nine to fives or how you earn your income or or work is the summation of kind of our, our efforts in life to build something, to do something meaningful. That is work. God created work in the garden. Adam and Eve, in perfection. God says, listen, the rest of this earth, you need to subdue it, have dominion over it. I've created this lush, incredible garden. You need to make the rest of the earth look like this. And so he gave Adam and Eve a job to do even Uh, when no sin had even entered into the world. Now, idolatry is when we'll take a good thing and we make it an ultimate thing, and we do that with work as well. We can idolize it. We can see it as this incredible means to an end, uh, be it financial or meaning or purpose or how we spend our time. And so we look to work and and jobs as a source of fulfillment, and, and we oftentimes will overwork. Americans are known for our good work ethic. Uh, you think all the way back, I, I, I love World War II history. And, and prior to the 1940s, America was not necessarily this superpower in the world. And then in the span of like eight months, we became one because everyone worked really hard at it. Uh, they worked very hard to produce what was needed for war. And that kind of changed the country. Uh, and so that's really baked into who we are. You meet someone new, what's one of the first questions you ask? What do you do? Because we kind of connect who we are as people to the jobs that we have and what we do with our everyday lives. Uh, And so we can conceptualize it that way. 
Uh, and, and we oftentimes will begin to say, well, we want a job that satisfies us, that gives us a purpose. And, and so then our meaning, again, this is where you can kind of idolize things, our meaning becomes attached to that job. And so uh, if it's an unsatisfying job, you'll probably become frustrated with it. If you love your job and, and you want to win at your job and climb some sort of ladder, you can overwork uh, and you can oftentimes work too hard. You can might work seven days a week. I remember Ray Newcomb uh, when he was interim pastor here. I don't know why I remember this. Uh, I just remember he saying about the Sabbath that if it takes you seven days to to get your job done, you're not a very good worker. <laughs> you're not much of a worker if you can't do it in six. Uh, but either way, uh, I, I think that we can overwork. I think that is a real temptation. But on the other hand, uh, because meaning is attached to work, and when we don't like our jobs or we don't like what we're engaged in, you become kind of despaired. A lot of times you find when people retire quickly after, they don't know how to fill their days and, and, and what they spent their time doing, they now are looking for a sense of purpose within that. Oftentimes people just don't want to work because they don't see the payoff. Again, looking at work as a means to an end, and those means aren't good enough, and, and so I don't want to engage in them. How many times have you heard the phrase, people don't want to work anymore? I read an editorial about that same line about a guy having to close his dry cleaner shop because he couldn't find anybody to work there. You know when that editorial was written? 1979. <laughs> uh, that phrase appears first in print in 1894. So uh, it seems like every generation thinks that the previous one is lazy. And so if you think that the current one's lazy, uh, don't worry, your predecessor said that about you too. Uh, and so oftentimes we will overwork or we will underwork. And then the corollary to that is we don't really know how to rest from our work. We don't know how to enjoy uh, rest. We don't know how to reward ourselves. And, and so we can either under reward ourselves or you can over reward yourself. You can be too lazy and and too rewarding. And so I feel like we have this strong identity of work, but at the same time, we don't really know how to navigate what that is. And so Psalm 127 is kind of an invitation to think through our jobs, our work, our vocation as much more than nine to five, as much more than how we pay our bills, as much more than W-2s and so forth, but instead invites us to say, your whole life is one of work that you are supposed to build something in your everyday life. You're supposed to build, uh, help build a society around us and serve others in in everyday life. And how you work is how you accomplish that. And we see in this psalm that God is ultimately the one doing all of that. So today's main idea of the message is this. uh, God works for and rewards his people. If you are weary today from laboring, I think this word is for you. And if you are struggling to find motivation, and, and, and you can, we got a new school year starting up, so you might be dreading that. Listen, uh, I think this word is for you. So if you have your copy of God's word, read with me Psalm 127. A song of ascents of Solomon. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. The word of the Lord. So, number one, God works for us. Now, I had to ask my wife before uh, this sermon, uh, are you in labor right now? And uh, not, not, not normally you have to ask that question. This is hopefully the only Sunday for the rest of our lives I'll have to ask that. Uh, and so, you know, you never know. Uh, but I'm going to try to work quickly here uh, in case something changes on that end. Uh, we're good for now, uh, but we'll see. We got a due date uh, in just a couple of days. So, uh, all right, God works for us. So when the Bible discusses work, it's much more than how we conceptualize it. Again, we think of work as what you're going to do tomorrow at 8 a.m. or 9 a.m. And we think of it as, as uh, what, what gets taxed or, or how we get the money to get taxed uh, later on. We think about work in terms of, of job and, and we have work life and you have home life and all those things are separate. But the Bible doesn't really see it that way. The Bible understands that everyday life is work, that all of your life is 
work. There's a, some great books to read on the subject. I can't get into all of it today. If you want some light reading, look up this book called Culture Making by Andy Crouch. It's phenomenal. But he talks about how the jobs that we have been given, be it our nine to five jobs or uh, just the work of homemaking, of being active in your community, of serving through your church, like whatever it may be, is all part of the work that God has given us. Because he created it in the garden, everything you engage in in everyday life is a sort of work, that we are to be producing some goodness in our lives. And obviously, your job is a big part of that, but home is a big part of that too. And so where we kind of draw a line between those two things, the Bible never really does that. It sees your entire life as one of, are you producing something good in the world? And so you see Solomon writing here, he says, unless the Lord is the one working, unless he's the one building, it's worthless. He uses this word vanity several times in there. Solomon's favorite word. If you've ever read the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, we're going to get into that in the fall on Wednesday nights. So I'd invite you to join us uh, in a couple weeks as we begin that. Um, but either way, uh, Ecclesiastes is a real downer. Like you read it and you need to go hug somebody afterwards. Uh, it, it, it uses this word vanity all the time in there and says that all of your life is basically meaningless. So eat, drink, and die. <laughs> like it's, it's a real somber message. Uh, but, but Solomon did not know about Jesus. And we'll get there in a second. Um, and so he writes so and he says in the first stanza, everything is basically meaningless apart from God's activity within us, within it. Some of us in here are laborers. You're literally house builders, uh, construction workers, and so forth. Some of us in here are literal watchmen, law enforcement officers. But, but outside of those two things, uh, what Solomon is trying to get at here is this idea of building things and protecting things. Building things in our lives and sustaining and seeing those things through. So we're all trying to create meaning. That's work. That's really what our work is, is how can I create meaning? And we all want to produce something that matters. We all want to build something that will outlast us. And so maybe that is your job, but that extends to the family, to the community, extends to students, the sports teams that you may be on, the clubs that you're in. Everything you produce is a part of building something. And then we strive to protect the things we've built, and so we want to make them last and we take these good things that we're after and we try to keep them around forever. And we don't want the good times to end. We, don't, we want to sustain and protect those good things to put up walls and defenses. And the effort that isn't spent on building is then spent on protecting. And here's what Solomon is telling us. If we do those things under our own power and for our own glory, they are worthless that we don't have enough in the tank to sustain us over the course of a lifetime to build and protect. You can try. You can give it your very best effort, and you might even get close to what you set out to accomplish, but unless the Lord is the one building and protecting, it's worthless. It's worthless. It's meaningless. It's not going to outlast you. It's not going to be passed on to future generations. It's not going to be something that is sustained because unless the Lord is the one doing it, it's attached to you and me. And guess what? We're finite. We're unnecessary to the world. We're limited. But God is not. He's infinite. He is necessary. He is Forever, and so the things that he is behind, that he, when you are serving him, serving in whatever capacity you have in your daily life, whether it's home building, jobs, anything in between, where you are active in service to the Lord, those things endure. It gives meaning to everyday life in a way that no other worldview can. There are a thousand menial things that have to be done every single day. And when you do those to the glory of God, there is a huge enduring effect on those. Imagine for a second that you're going to get to write your own obituary. Now, in my line of work, I get to read a lot of obituaries. Some of you might be uh, weirdly read those in the newspaper. <laughs> but either way, uh, whatever it may be, your obituary, right? 
Obituaries all say the same thing. Not all the same, but, but they have the same kind of general flow to the person's name, where they were from, what they did most of their lives, their hobbies, and then their families. What Solomon is telling us here is that if you want your obituary to be much more than just a words on a page that endure for years and decades and generations after you're gone, it has to be done for the Lord's glory and for the Lord to be the one who's actively working on your behalf. That if you're doing it on your own, your obituary is going to end there. But if you're doing it for the Lord and with the Lord, you will endure. We want to protect, we want to build our little kingdoms, but, but that puts us in the place of God and that's a place that we're not meant to be. God's the one protecting. He's the one that knows everything. He's the one that's got the power to hold all things together. All things were made for Christ and through Christ and by Christ and held together in Christ. And so your life can be placed at the feet of Jesus. Your home, your job, you're trying to work up the motivation to go to tomorrow morning. You can place that at the feet of Jesus and understand that, hey, he's the one who is holding all things together. It's not our responsibility to do that, not our role. I love that Solomon basically says, you can wake up at the crack of dawn, you can burn the midnight oil, but whatever you do, it's worthless. You can't accomplish everything you need to get done if you're doing it on your own. And there's the joy for the believer. Here's your hope for today is that it's not up to you and me. That work is good. Protecting is good. We should be engaged in those things. But understanding that it's not us that does all of that. That is a tremendous joy. It removes such a burden from life to think that you're the one who's got to keep it all going. And so we can look at our lives, our careers, our families, our communities, and understand where our place is in the whole story. We have roles to play, but we are not ultimate. And then he says this great line in there. He gives to his beloved sleep. He allows you to rest. And I think sleep can be both literal and metaphoric here. Literally, we can turn off the worry at night and go to bed. Or at midday if you're on shifts, whatever. (laughs) You can rest. You can turn it all off and understand I can depart from consciousness for a little bit and be okay. Because God is active and at work. Sleep is a daily reminder that we are not God. Now, point of transparency here. I don't like sleeping. Hate it. Hate bedtime. Don't like going to bed and beat it all. All my kids don't either. My wife is uh, a trooper. She deserves a medal. None of us like going to sleep. It's like baked into our genes partly, but also a lot of really uh, self-inflicted decisions there. But either way, uh, why? Because sleep is you have to check out. You have to say, I am going to escape from consciousness for a little bit. And who knows what can go on while my eyes are closed. You think about it, it is an extremely vulnerable position to be in, to be asleep. And the richest, most powerful man in the world has to check out for at least four to six hours a day if he's going to keep going for tomorrow, and he needs eight. It's a really vulnerable position to be in, and God says, guess what? You can enjoy that with me because I don't sleep. I give you that gift, but I don't have to do it. It can be literal. It can be a metaphor that you can just rest that you don't have to struggle all day every day with the anxieties of keeping it all going, but instead you can detach a little bit and say that God is the one at work. God's the one doing all of this around me. You can do that confidently if the Lord is the one working for us. He is protecting, he is building, and here's why. Because God's work secures our reward. Now the whole key to this text, to understanding what he's getting at here is in verse 2. He uses this word in there. My translation says beloved. And yours may say uh, loved. But either way, the point they're trying to get at here, Solomon's writing this and says that you and I, God's people, are his beloved. Now this is not like a little, oh, I love you, like we say today. My son, my youngest for now, for four more days, uh, hopefully, or two if you're Amber, uh, my, my third born, we'll put it that way. Uh, he has conflated goodbye, hello, good night, and I love you with blowing a kiss. 
cutest thing you've ever seen in your life. Um, and he will try to woo you with that and get things from you uh, by doing that. Uh, he knows how cute it is. But either way, uh, it's at times a little bit, I don't want to dish on my kid here, but uh, maybe a little disingenuous at times. God's love for us is never that way. When he says, we are his, when he gives to his beloved sleep, that word beloved there is the same root used all throughout the Old Testament to describe love, and not in some general sense, but like Song of Solomon type love. I mean, it is passionate. It is engaged. It is real. And that is how much God loves you and me. Like, like we don't have to go to sleep convinced that God loves us. It doesn't matter what you think. He does. And if you say, well, I don't really feel that right now. So what? He still does. He said, I don't even really want that right now. Guess what? He still does. And you know how we know that? Because the cross of Jesus is a massive billboard that says, the second you begin to doubt my feelings for you, look at what I did. Look at the empty tomb. Look at where I'm never going back again. Look at the, the, what I endured for you. That's how much he loves you. And so when he says, I give to my beloved sleep, it's not just poetic terms here, but it's actual feeling from the Lord that he loves you. He cares for you. I heard a guy this week say that his, he's defaulted to an evangelistic strategy where he, when he's talking with people, he'll say, has someone told you today how much God loves you? And if they say no, he says, well, can I be the first? I mean, how rare it is for us to hear that we are loved. God loves you. I could stand up here all day long and just say that over and over and over again, and that would be a true sermon that we could do. Christ has purchased us with his own blood. And so if he will do that, if he will give your soul eternal rest in his new kingdom, don't you think that you can go to sleep tonight knowing that you're secure? That if you're trusting him with the next billion years of your life, don't you think you can trust him with the first full week of August in 2023? I think so. I think that that is a gift from the Lord where he says, you can rest because what I've done for you is real. We sing a song. He's got the whole world in his hands. Well, Psalm 127 is an invitation to believe that song, that he really does have the whole world in his hands. He's got you and me and every other person who's ever called on the name of the Lord for salvation in his grasp. So we can close our eyes at night and rest knowing that God loves us. My sons read a book this week um, about a pig who, I can't remember what gets stolen from the pig. Uh, but either way, it got them on the idea of robbers. And uh, so we're going to sleep. And of course, they're all worried because this pig got broken into and uh, somebody stole something from it. And uh, I said, look, nobody's breaking in here. They said, why? And I said, because I installed those deadbolts with three-inch construction locks, but no, <laughs> construction screws. But uh, no, that's not what I said. I said, because I'm in control in this house. I'm the king of Cumberland Street, <laughs> that I am the meanest, baddest dude in Savannah. And every single person, when they drive by, says, I know I can't mess with that guy. And they looked at me like I was a liar. <laughs> I said, I'm not going to let anything happen to you. Psalm 127 is this invitation to believe that about our Heavenly Father. That even if something physically happens to us, where are we headed? I feel like I say this every single week. New Jerusalem. It only gets better from here. And so whatever physical hurt may come and eventual death that's coming for all of us, eternal security is ours in Christ Jesus. And so you can rest knowing that. And then this second stanza comes along, verses 3 through 5. It's like a Monty Python, and now for something completely different. <laughs> he switches from this idea of working, resting, eating, sleeping, to these verses about children. You're know, like, what is this about? Why is he going on talking about kids and archery? Well, it's a continuation and an illustration of the first stanza. You see how he does this? Look, the toil and work of protecting and building and daily waking up and going to bed is contrasted with the craziness of child rearing. 
in the rat race of life, in a world where most think that their success and their joy and their meaning comes from what they do and how much they make and, and what they produce in the world, God says, guess what? The true reality, the true expression of building and protecting comes in the most vulnerable little state, a baby. And how much work? Now, <laughs> this, uh, I read a, read a book about the Psalms of Ascent, and the guy writing it is, uh, he says, look, we participate in child making, but really God is the one doing most of the work. Uh, and he goes on and on and on talking about how uh, passive we are in um, raising kids or really growing kids inside the womb. And I just, going through this uh, for the fourth time, I kind of like, of course a guy wrote this book. <laughs> of course a man wrote this book. Like he not really realizing uh, the work that goes into pregnancy. But either way, uh, there is a truth there that God is the one who's doing the growth. God is the one who gives life, that the chances of life, if you go look at, you know, some good biology uh, textbooks, videos, it'll tell you the chances of life are like one in a billion, right? And, and, and it happens all the time that God gives life and he protects it and he sustains it. He's saying, look, I'm doing that. I'm the one that has the ability to do that. You really don't. Like you can participate, you can do the, the action of producing life, but at the end of the day, it's me that dictates whether it comes or not. And so this text is showing us that in child raising, in securing future generations, that's God's work. He plays the long game. Our rewards are not seen in quarterly business reports in the stock market. Our rewards are seen over the lifetimes of future generations. Now we live in a day where kids are not seen as a heritage from the Lord. That they are not celebrated as a reward Instead, they're seen as roadblocks to career building. They're seen as nuisances. They're said that they're loud or they're gross or they're messy. And just a quick side note here, okay? And I'm maybe saying this because uh, I'm about to bring one into the world or Amber is right there. Uh, if you got a kid who is in church and is active and being a kid, and someone shoots you a dirty look, okay, that person needs to leave and you need to stay, okay? They're, they're not welcome, you are. And I'm not much of a preacher if I can't preach through a kid talking every now and again, okay? They're, they're incredible. They're the best. Kids are phenomenal. They are a reward. They are proof that God is in the work of reproduction, of seeing the human race continue on for his glory and our ultimate good. And so when he says that he does this, it's an incredible thing. And so when society tells you that, oh, no, the, the world's warming up, or, oh, no, there's going to be a food shortage, they've been doing that for centuries now. Like for centuries they've been told, oh, how could you bring a kid into this world? Well, I can't unless I'm resting in the Lord. They will be a roadblock. They will be a nuisance. They will be a stumbling block if I am working all day long, eating the bread of anxious toil, doing all things for my glory because it all starts and ends with me. Yeah, I wouldn't want to bring a kid into that. But guess what? When I rest in the Lord... When I understand that he is the one protecting, he's the one watching, he's the one doing all of the sustaining, guess what? Bring on the babies. Because the future is bright. Why? Because Christ Jesus is building his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So confidently bring kids into the world. Confidently understand that future generations are secure in the Lord. I love it that in this psalm, he basically illustrates the whole first stanza with, I protect the small things. That's God. That's the God we serve. Now, this text is not an ultimate guarantee of kids, but it is an ultimate declaration that children are good and that having kids is a great thing. There's a classic line that I hear young people take, when are you going to have kids? Well, when we're ready. I'll give you a pastoral tip, okay? You're never going to be ready ever. <laughs> Not once. Like no point in your life are you going to have enough money? Or are you going to be stable enough? Like you're never going to be ready. So I have the kids. God's the one building and sustaining. God is the one that gives life. And what are kids? They're like arrows in a quiver. Now what's the difference between a sword and an arrow? 
you have to release an arrow. You have to let it go. You can't hold on to it. At some point, you got to let it go and hope that it meets its target. Parents, our job is to prepare and disciple and train our kids and then let them go. They are their own little souls with their own accountability to the Lord. We cannot lord over that. We cannot play intermediary or intercessor. That belongs to Jesus alone. At some point, we have to let our kids grow up. So Rex, my oldest, starts preschool tomorrow. He's nervous. I'm nervous. <laughs> we went and looked at his school the other day, and he, was, uh, he looked very young, right? I mean, he looked small. He was nervous. And, and I was having all these premonitions of the next 20 years, like all these major events in life. Like it was just, it's been a real emotional couple of weeks uh, in my family. And I just, this psalm was just like medicine to the soul. Got to let them go. That's your job. You train them up. That they are not ours to harbor all day long. Arrows in the quiver are really kind of worthless. Right? You can, oh, well, what if the, the arrowhead chips? It's, it, it got shot. That's why it chipped. Oh, what if the fletchings come off? It, guess what? That's what it's designed to do. What if the shaft breaks? We want to protect our kids so badly that we sometimes leave them in the quiver and they never get used. They never get released. They never leave their father and mother. They don't leave and cleave. Prepare your kids. Disciple them. Love them. Point them in the right direction. Be a good archer. Like, put them on target. Let go. And trust that the Lord is protecting and building them. Not you. Not me. Hard truth. I'm having to live it. I'm going to have to live it tomorrow morning <laughs> at 8 a.m. And I'm going to know deep in my bones. I might not feel this, but at 8 a.m. tomorrow morning, I am going to be praying Psalm 127 uh, over my family's life. And so the best thing you can do for your kid is to teach them the grace of God found in Christ Jesus the Lord embody that for them, live up to the holy standard that God has called us to live, and then when you fail, repent of that and teach them how a, a, a mature person repents before the Lord, and then let them go. Who can do that? Who can possibly look around the world right now and say, yes, I can do that, and I'm ecstatic about that. The beloved of God can do that. Why? Because they are resting in the Lord. Why? Because he has secured them with his own blood. Why? Because he loves you. You see how this chain goes? It's incredible. It gives you so much confidence to go through life. He goes on, he says, the arrow is like the reward. Kids are like a reward. Well, here's the thing. Kids don't do much for you. It's a good thing they're cute because they're not much else for the first several years of their lives. <laughs> The reward is lifelong. And I give a quick word here because I know we have a lot of caregiving uh, children in here. You're caring for aging parents, older parents. Thank you. In your service to your ailing and aging parent and, and in the caregiving that you are doing, you are proving Psalm 127 to be true. That you are living out what God has called you to do. Honor your father and mother doesn't have an expiration date. And so when you are a caregiving child, and it's hard, it's exhausting. It's, it's, I've, I've see this with people we got in our church now. I've, I've lived this with watching my parents. Like I, I see how draining it can be. Who can do it? The beloved of God. Those who know that there's a dignity to me rewarding my parents for bringing me into this world that I'm living out the truths of Psalm 127. Because it's easy? No. Because it's right? Yes. And you can rest at night knowing that the Lord is protecting and watching. So there's a truth for you as well. Last thing, you may be in here thinking, well, I don't have kids. Well, it's almost college football time, so I'll hit you with a Lee Corso. Not so fast, my friend. <laughs> You're in this too. We're all in this together, okay? The Old Testament has a lot of literal uh, promises. The New Testament, Jesus tells us that his kingdom is being reframed as a spiritual kingdom. And so there's so much more than just biology, but instead there's a brand new family being formed. Jesus says, who are my mother and brother? Whoever does the will of God. And so if you're in here right now and you are a, a, a 
confessing Christian, you are a member of Jesus' church. And you too have a responsibility to secure future generations. So yes, absolutely, there's a biological aspect to this, but there's also a spiritual one to it as well. As far as we know, the Apostle Paul didn't have kids, but he calls both Timothy and Titus his true sons in the faith. And so you and I have a responsibility to see future generations outside of our own DNA and those that are covered in all of Christ's blood. And we have a huge problem at this church. Let's talk business for a second. It's the best possible problem you can have. We got too many kids, or rather, we got as many kids as the Lord wants us to have, and I'm praying for more. We don't have enough volunteers for those kids. It's the best problem. I was talking at Vacation Bible School with several of our, our workers, and they said, look, 10 plus years ago, we started praying that our nursery would be filled up. And guess what? It is. And so it's a great problem to have. It's phenomenal. I, this is the problem I've been asking God to bring us. And so we need more help in the nursery. I was in kids ministry for five plus years. Uh, you never have enough helpers. And so if you're sitting here thinking, well, kids ministry is not my gift, does Psalm 127 apply to you? It's a trick question. <laughs> it does. And so if you're sitting here, look, there. There's no such thing as, well, my kids are out of the house. I'm done with future generations. Not true. And here's the thing. If you think the future generations are not good, don't you dare speak a word again about it if you're not going to lift a finger to help them grow and in, into the next one, right? And I know our church will do this because you've done this a thousand times over. You've done this in my life personally. You've seen, I know so many others that have done this in too. So if you have any desire to serve with kids in any capacity, Miss Debbie would love to speak with you because here's the reality. If we don't get anybody to help out, I am going to have to go do that on Sunday mornings because I'm the one who keeps filling up the nursery. <laughs> it's my fault. <laughs> and, and I don't even know who's gonna preach at that point. <laughs> I am so excited about the future of Jesus' church in Hardin County, in our community, in this church specifically. And you know why I'm so excited about that? Because I know about all the kids that are over there. And I know the futures that are out there for them. And I know the, 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 the spirit that is going to draw them to himself. And I cannot wait. I'm just going to baptize them. I'm, I'm just like chomping at the bit. Borderline Presbyterian in here right now. I'm going to get them in. The, just kidding. That's a joke. After they confess faith. All right. <laughs> It's a wonderful problem to have, and, and we're experiencing growing pains. That's phenomenal. It's a great thing. And so I'm super excited about what the Lord has in the future. Wednesday nights, our meals that we're trying to provide for those families uh, is a big part of that too. And so if that's another area where you want to serve, you want to give back to families, that's a great way to do it. No one retires from Psalm 127. Uh, we do all we can. Uh, to see future generations grow. So it all applies to us in different ways, but the truth is the same for all of us. Kids are a great thing, and work and protect them. We're supposed to do that, and we relinquish them to the Lord, knowing that ultimately he knows what's best, and he is the one who is protecting them. All right, so what are you building in life? What are you trying to do? What kind of meaning are you trying to make Home building, career building, whatever it may be, if you're doing it from your own well, that well is going to run dry at some point. You're going to burn out. You're going to get despaired. But if you see your activity in the world as producing goodness and serving others because you have been commanded by God to do that, then God is the one who's ultimately working through you, and he's the one that's building something to last forever. What did Paul say? Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all things to the glory of God. How can you do that confidently? Because you know that it's God doing it through you. It's a phenomenal truth. Psalm 127, work hard for the Lord, knowing that he's sustaining and protecting us. We're going to take the Lord's Supper after the invitation. And I think that the Lord's Supper is like the best way to live this truth out. If you say, okay, well, I'm having a hard time resting in my work and my protection, you need to remember that you are God's beloved. And how do you remember that? Through the bread and the cup, we remember that Christ loves us. How can you be so certain? What we're going to take here in just a second, we remember what Christ has done for us. 
Um, so we're going to have an invitation time. If you need to speak with the Lord and, and kind of converse with him in your heart, uh, feel free to do that. You can come pray at the altar. Uh, a couple things about the Lord's Supper is uh, it is for believers. It is for God's beloved. And if you are not in God's beloved, you can be today. And you should be. So come on. Like, repent of your sins. Follow the Lord. Uh, trust in him. So the Lord's Supper is for believers uh, because we are confessing our belief that Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. Um, and then the other element to it is don't take it if you've got sin in your life that is unconfessed and unrepented of. If you are at odds with a brother, you need to make that right. Um, or a brother or a sister, you need to make that right. So don't take it in an unworthy manner uh, because that kind of demeans the purpose of it uh, to be at peace with all people because of the peace that God gives us through Jesus Christ. Um, so uh, I'm going to pray for us and then we're going to respond to the Lord and take the Lord's Supper. Let's pray. Father, work in our lives. We ask you to do that. We ask you to work through us and for us, to protect us. We thank you for the gift of life, for the gift of childbirth and future generations to come. And thank you that we get to play a part in that. Whether it be our biological family or our spiritual family. And God, by your grace, those things are the same, hopefully. We pray that you would work mightily in our church. Not just so that we can build a church here because we are your church so we can be a part of what God is doing in the world. Thank you for this community. Thank you for the dozens and dozens of churches that are meeting right now to confess your great name. And I pray you'd bless them as well. I pray you'd bind us all together to shine your light in a dark world. So may we do so knowing that you're the one working through us. You're the one protecting us. You're the one who gives us our daily bread. So may we commune with you right now. We ask these things in Christ's name, amen. Would you stand and worship with us?